My name is Susan Ilian, and I am very, very proud to be your MC for the Global Inclusive Education Virtual Summer Camp 2021. And it's brought to you by the Cadet Academy and proudly supported by Nessie Learn. I want to welcome you all to the 21 Global Inclusive Education Summer Camp. I'm the founder and executive director of Cadet Academy. Cadet Academy stands for Comprehensive Autism and Related Disability Education and Training Academy. Permit me one to welcome you, particularly our guest speakers and our participants. We have speakers from eight different countries, from different walks of life, who have been generous enough to give us their time today to speak to us from their wealth of knowledge. And I want to particularly thank our participants. Thank you. People started registering over two, three months ago. It was quite encouraging. We really want to do something about inclusive education. So how does this summer camp engage with those opportunities to ensure that things are embedded in policy frameworks? How do we use this to learn sufficient lessons about how to build awareness? How do we improve the learning environment, not just for persons with disability within mainstream schools, but for those who have to teach them? How do we then emphasize the cost-effective infrastructural changes that need to be made in order to make uh, inclusive education a reality? I am very happy to be here. Um, just a little about myself. Uh, I have been working in the development sector for over 12, 13 years now. And my area of expertise has been girl-child education, women and youth empowerment, and disability inclusion, conflict management, and peace building. Um, so when um, Mr. Charles was talking about um, all those relevant points, um, you know, it was more like a reflection for me. So thank you so uh, very much, Mr. Bani, for your uh, very powerful uh, keynote address. Lola and her team have written a, an advanced set of modules for our dyslexia training program that is being produced now. And um, it is specific to the African continent, and we were delighted to get um, some uh, Nigerian voice artists to record it. And right now it's being animated, so we're really uh, excited to, to see how that program is developing. And I think it's going to be a great asset to not only to, to Africa, but I think worldwide. It's going to be provide a great amount of uh, important teaching uh, for teachers. So it'll take them beyond the basic level to a more specialist level of expertise. IBCCES, we have worked with Cadet Academy. We're really honored to be here today. And uh, IBCCS is based in the United States, but we have certificates in over 87 countries worldwide. So we do provide services all over the globe. And our programs are online training and certification programs for healthcare, corporate, and education professionals to work with or even employ individuals with cognitive disorders or other needs. Um, and now it's, uh, now it's my turn to talk. So I'm gonna share my screen and we'll let the fun begin. Uh, take a look at how we can promote social inclusion for autistic individuals and people with other conditions in education. So we'll begin with a little bit about me. What brings me here to talk to you? Uh, for me, things were pretty typical at first. At 24 hours of age, my wife says I looked like an egg. And then at 18 months, like what happens to about 30% of us on the autism spectrum, the autism bomb exploded where I lost functional communication, had meltdowns, withdrew from the environment, and in brief, I became a very autistic little kid. There was so little known about autism in those days. Where does autism come from? What can we do with autism by working with the strengths of autistic individuals? And we're continuing to ask these questions today. There was so little known about autism in those days that it took my parents a year to find a place for diagnosis. And when they did, the doctors said they had never seen such a sick child and they recommended institutionalization. Fortunately, my parents, like we see ever increasing numbers of parents around the world, 
they advocated on my behalf and they convinced the school to take me in about a year. And it was during that year my parents implemented what we would today refer to as an intensive home-based early intervention program. Out of school children are just one one segment of children excluded. And being an education specialist, I'm really interested in, in the marginalized. So I thought that I should just expand the discussion and just um, speak briefly about that. I probably won't need um, 20 minutes. Let me see how to share my space of people who are not accessing education. One is those who are out of school, and that's the topic that I was given. Then the other group of children that are not accessing, they're in school, but they're not learning. So if you're in school and the school isn't meeting your needs, you might as well be excluded. So I think that's the discussion that we've been having all morning when we're looking at autism and children with special needs. How do you meet their needs? That's one group, the group of children with special needs. But there are other groups of children who are in school, um, maybe without special needs, but also are not accessing education for many reasons. Either because the teachers are not coming or maybe they are slow learners or maybe the infrastructure is just not there to accommodate them and then um, or they are not just being guided the teachers are not competent to teach so there are many reasons why those even in school are not accessing um, um, education but how do we do inclusive education in all schools if t teachers are not trained that it's it boggles my mind for us here and for what we do in Ghana, first of all, I'll tell you about me, why we set up the center. As has been said, my son is now 39, by the way. What do we do? We've been doing autism awareness, caregiving care. Um, parents are very, very distraught and beside themselves when they come. And the schools that we had, that we say inclusive education, so parents here inclusive education, first of all, there's the stigma. So they do not even want to come to centers like we have, and then they go to the schools and then are denied access to the schools. So we support them by saying, you come to the center, and then we work with the schools within our communities. So we go to the schools and talk to them. We have a video of what we've done with the children and we show them what the possibilities are. appreciate you so much and for your participation, everyone, with the questions. Keep them coming and we will keep them answered. Uh, thank you for your contribution and we will see you tomorrow for day two, same time, place. See you all. Education Virtual Summer Camp 2021, brought to you by the Cadet Academy and supported by Nessie Learning. My name is Susan Illion, and it is an absolute pleasure to be your MC over the next couple of days while we discuss important issues revolving around inclusive education in the face of COVID-19 and the challenges and opportunities that are faced as a result of- because I know there are several people in this meeting from different parts of the world. And um, I want to say thank you to as many people that um, joined us yesterday for an interesting session. It is uh, wonderful to be here today. Uh, I'm Temple Brandon. I'm a professor of animal science at uh, Colorado State University. In fact, I've worked there for 31 years. And when I was a young child, I had no speech. And I had a lot of repetitive behavior, a lot of screaming and tantrums. And, and when I was a young child, a lot of doctors didn't even know what autism was, because this was back in 1949, and two-year-old, I didn't talk. I went into very good speech therapy. I cannot emphasize enough, if you have a young child, two years old, four-year-old, not talking, you've got to start working with them. Do not wait for a diagnosis. The first thing you have to do is make sure the child is not deaf. So children with neurodevelopmental impairments 
have all of this, mostly their mental and social well-being are uh, adversely affected by their health condition. There is a good connection between your gut and your brain. So you can experience some of these like uh, sensory disorders and even autism. Um, I'll just introduce the next speaker. Ko will be speaking to us all the way from India. Um, she will be talking to us this afternoon or this time on a very interesting topic, um, which is inclusive education in India, a practical experience. Yes, you know? I have been working very closely with the schools in India and helping schools to develop inclusive setups for children with uh, additional needs. And uh, with the help of uh, Lola, I founded a global inclusion platform called I for Inclusion only last year. It's a collaborative platform and my friends from Nigeria, Lola Blessing from Nigeria, Tiffany from the UK and uh, two other friends from the US are integral parts of it. So to me, 75% of Indian children with disabilities do not attend any educational institution during their lifetime. Involving parents and communities is one uh, important component. And uh, as you know that the acceptance of this child by uh, parents and members of the community influences the uh, personality of the child and determines the attitude and treatment of other family or community members towards them. And this is actually missing. Equal opportunities and full participation. As we all know that inclusive education is based on the philosophy of disadvantage is considered as a special need and that individual will need to be able to improve the quality of life of that individual and that's where all of these discussions around the special needs trust comes in. We need to be able to take care of the medical needs of the child with all um, whether it's an adult or just a child, we need to be able to take care of whatever requirements. So when it comes to even moving the child from one um, from one location to another, when when it involves even visiting the hospital, um, and like I pointed out earlier, on, and when even when it comes to physiotherapy or whatever it is, it is important that we have funds available managed by an institution such that that person is not left in a disadvantaged position program now so a trust basically protects and provides a firewall for the person with a special that once those assets are already in the trust no other person becomes a beneficiary of that arrangement it's also important to state clearly that no other person has the rights and control or authority over those assets apart from the trustee the trustee that's because the trustee has been legally appointed and mandated to manage the assets that have been put in the trust arrangement. What that also means is that parents now have that comfort that whatever assets that have been set aside will be used for the purpose for which... See, one of the problems is autism is so very, or screaming behavior in one situation, maybe biological sensory overload. In another situation, the child has learned to manipulate. I think this child is in this question has learned to manipulate. Used to ensure that a child with autism learns alongside his peers while lessons are, going, are ongoing. While the lesson is ongoing, what strategy do teachers use to ensure that a child with autism learns alongside his peers? The first thing is you've got to control bullying. When I was in high school, uh, other uh, students called me names, all kinds of bad names. But when I was in uh, primary grades, my teacher explained to the other children that I had a disability that was not visible like a wheelchair and that they needed to be helping me and they needed to be explaining things to me, not bullying me. And this was very helpful. And 
I was um, included in a small school with a normal school that had 12 students in a class. Now, in a big classroom with 30 students, autism is so variable. I can't emphasize that enough. Uh, some classrooms are too noisy. That can be a problem. Uh, that can be a big problem. Some classrooms, uh, if they do not have windows, LED lighting may flicker. Uh, that can be a problem. Some individuals with autism will need sensory breaks. They'll need some time where they can go to a quiet place and just calm down. And then simple sensory devices, such as a weighted blanket or a weighted vest, can be helpful that you wear for 20 minutes and then you take it off. The sensory needs need to be addressed. And I'm trying to find ways to simplify. There were some good talks to, in there about the diets, but that has to be greatly simplified so you can do it in, in Nigeria. Yeah, taking wheat out, I've seen kids uh, have improvements when you take wheat out. Um, yogurt, you might be able to make that. They, um, but there's a lot of different strategies uh, to help uh, you know, the child be in the regular class. That that's a wrap for yet another informative session on the Global Inclusive Education Virtual Summer Camp 2021. A big thank you to all of our speakers today. We do appreciate you sharing your experience and knowledge with us. Tomorrow is our third and final day of our virtual summer camp. So we look forward to seeing you all right back here at the same time with the same system. of the Global Inclusive Education Virtual Summer Camp 2021. Now, the first summer camp ever took place in 2019 in Abuja, Lagos, and uh, Port Harcourt. And it was our dream that we make this global, then the advent of COVID-19. So you can talk to us about dyslexia and the great job that the message is doing about children with dyslexia all around the world and the partnership in, in place with Cadet Academy to favor the Nigerian students or learners with dyslexia. And in Africa, the world-renowned Professor Temple Gradin herself with us. She's also an adult living with autism and she's done so well. So we had to talk to us about practical things we could do to understand and include individuals with autism in our educational system. I also want all just to commit to a lifestyle of not just learning. Please, let's be very deliberate about implementing all that we've been learning and taking away from today's summer camp. You know, the beauty is not about learning alone, but actually in the truth. It's really my pleasure to be with you, Lola, as my dear friend, and to be with everybody here today. Um, another day, three um, powerful packed um, sessions we're going to have. I'll be more about inclusive education, the challenges, opportunities, and the intersection with applied behavior analysis intervention. So the role of ABA professionals, I need to, I cannot enumerate all, large, but just to let you know the opportunities that are available. We are involved with continuous assessment, informed personalized, personalized curriculum development, and the skill tracking system, and all. And we need all this as a primary prerequisite for appropriate educational placement and management for this category of, of learners. We are also involved in behavior reduction and skill acquisition training. Education of, education of teachers to assist parents, caregivers, and teachers and other, other professionals in uh, carrying out uh, effective utilized. Uh, functional, uh, functional and academic living skills and living skills. Anyway. Then, what are these basic living skills, community participation skills, uh, school skills, that's academic and social, vocational skills, independent living Teamwork is very important. We cannot go and play the role of a physical therapist. Same thing with 
I will be the registered river technician and uh, ABA tech. They are out there. Who have had some uh, three months level of training that need to be deployed to skills that will give all this help behind. Because the teacher cannot do it alone. And even the teachers themselves, they are supposed to undergo some training. We are profit, like seeing you regular seminar to get some, a feel of how these strategies are put out there. I showed the horse. I've been in special education for the past 30 years. I started my practice in Nigeria, and then I moved to Netherlands, then I moved to Tunisia, and now I'm in South Korea. So I'll be bringing together wealth of cultural influence in education when it comes to the issue of inclusive education. That um, attitude in Africa that says, oh, teachers are responsible for my children as long as I pay their fees and parents find other means of occupying themselves. But that is not acceptable. The teachers and the parents need to work hand in hand, especially for special needs children, for them to be successful in all ways. But you as a parent, you are the captain of the ship. You need to steer the ship to reach the goal that is desired of your child. You cannot leave the responsibility of the growth and the development of your child to a third person, which is usually a teacher or a caregiver. The work of the parent is not the work of the teacher. The teachers will only build when the parent has been able to establish this at home with their So children. today we'll really be delving into literacy instruction, um, lessons from the COVID-19 pandemic. And so I just want to premise this presentation with just the idea that some of the things that we found out or that were illuminated in terms of literacy instruction within COVID-19, it's we, we, we already knew them. It just so happens that because students were now at home with parents, um, it just um, dawned upon you know, researchers in the field of literacy, um, and this is the field that I am in, just to really make this information a little bit more accessible to parents and as well as to, to teachers. So today, I my aim for this presentation is really to provide some practical tips on the different dimensions of literacy and how we can ensure that while students are at home or sometimes even in the classroom, we can still be building their literacy knowledge. Um, and this is for students um, um, primarily with dyslexia reading difficulties, but it also in the spirit of inclusion, it can also be applied to students without reading. You can see the brain on the, the left hand side, it just shows that there's lower connection in terms of the brain areas that are responsible for reading and for literacy development. On the, the brain that's on the right hand side, you can see this student actually has a higher connectivity. So it means that the student on the left, the right hand side would actually be a better reader because they have higher connectivity in the brain pathways that are responsible for English. English is a primary instruction in school. What if you don't normally use English at home? Can you still have conversational, meaningful conversational ter turns in your local language? So first I would like to to thank the organization uh, team for their invitation and Miss Lola for her great enthusiasm and uh, great professionalism which are really very obvious. Uh, some of these children they may need work on uh, the speech or the oral motor skills and still there is a lot of debate uh, around whether oral motor therapy is needed for all children or it can really um, target uh, the speech skills or they just uh, can improve uh, the feeding or the swallowing abilities, but yet in some children it's really uh, very uh, beneficial. It can include using some tools like the talk tools, which provide like a systematic or a graded way to help these children, for example, uh, in uh, their respiration to improve their, or breathing to improve their uh, speech clarity or in the blowing abilities, in rounding their lips or in uh, strengthening their jaw or controlling their jaw. Or uh, even we can use uh, very simple tools such as here the tongue depressor, for example, is placed between the lips to help the child maintain the proper lip closure or sometimes it's placed between the teeth horizontally to have the child elevate the jaw against gravity for example until counting till five or ten uh, depending on his ability and move uh, gradually from this point as for the articulation disorders improving the speech itself we can work by phonetic placement techniques this is for the high function children at the 
of operative bonds we, we, where we show them diagrams where are the sounds uh, uh, really produced in the uh, vocal tract or in the speech organs and how to produce them. We can help the child manually by using physical prompts, either partial or complete physical prompts. We can show him like flip books to show him, for example, here how to produce the word Baba. We can use even some instrumental or objective measures such as the nasometer where the child can get a feedback on the monitor uh, about his visuality and there is a reference slide. Uh, I'm here again today uh, and I'm going to be running this session uh, from now till I also want to thank you and your team for the excellent work that has been done so far and you continue to do. So we do appreciate what you're doing and uh, we pray that this will continue even to make much more impact even in our society and communities. Going I, will be, I will be speaking and touching on the person-centered approach to skills development for persons with us here. For those of us on the platform now, if you were to just take a moment and then those who are grown up, if your son or your daughter comes to you and says, I want to marry a deaf person, how would you respond? So when we talk about, a, when I talk about a person-centered approach, we're saying that the individual is always, emphasis on always, at the center of the proposed service or whatever intervention that we're talking about. Now, we need to presume competence of people with disabilities. I think it was Professor Temple Brandon who spoke yesterday, or, and Professor Shaw as well, that the fact that somebody is not able to communicate verbally doesn't mean the person cannot communicate at all. Because even a deaf person can still write and, and you can communicate. A person even with autism can still communicate and we can still get the message. So we must presume competence on the ability of the persons with disabilities. So the focus is on what they can do and every person has some skills and abilities that they can bring to the table and contribute. I mean, because of society, people like Professor Shaw, Professor Grandin, Elon Musk, um, what's his name, Steve Jobs, society is, the society is better today. We're all using, most people use Apple iPhones, but that was designed by a person with disability. I'm speaking on um, safety considerations for children with special needs in online inclusive education. So we must begin to understand that when we talk about inclusion in terms of online education, we must carry our children along. And we know that we have a wide range, there's a wide spectrum of, of spectrum of special needs. So you must take your unique child's um, abilities into consideration when choosing or deciding on the platform to use. So inclusion is no longer about just physical spaces. It's now in online spaces. And it's not going to change anytime soon. Going forward, there are going to be more and more needs and desires that would cause us to use more online platforms. So the earlier we start taking certain considerations into um, certain things into consideration, the better for us. So what are tips for an inclusive online environment? So if you are introducing your child to the online environment to study or have classes or have access to their facilitators and teachers, what are the important things that is required? The first is that interface must use simple language so that it can be easily grasped. The cost of you know, going around and teaching children, what I have found is many children have been exposed to safety situations and they did not know what to do because nobody told them. But if they have been equipped, when they find themselves in that situation, they would know how to respond and not necessarily react, how to respond. Again, is enhancing children's independent daily academic experiences as an inclusive therapy. I know that somehow many of us have heard about occupational therapy and activities of daily living and all sorts of factors related to this particular term. But today, I want to open our eyes to something which is what my presentation is going to be answering. Just two questions. How can we integrate proposed school therapies into children's academies? How can we integrate proposed school therapies into children's academies? And now today I'm not just talking about children with disabilities, but all children. I'm all inclusive. And the second question is, what long-term independent complex skills are we addressing with inclusive now, What about these children with disabilities? How do we help them with their perception? So the child that can go with the stairs and the child that cannot go with the stairs start having a perception of what? Restrictive environment, disability, 
discomfort, the complex of an environment that does not appreciate the different abilities that they have. And this is where the problem is coming from and why the parents don't even know if we are important in helping these children in their daily life. What should be the school-related outcome? Basically, as an occupational therapist, we believe that there are two or uh, three things. The academic aspect, the non-academic aspect, and the pre-vocational and vocational aspect, which you can ask, what would you advise us to invest in right now? And I said, it's accessibility. Because this is Africa. Africa and accessibility, we are words and opposites. Accessibility. Do we have accessible playgrounds? Right now, parents are asking, where will my child work in future? Your child can work in the accessible playground you start creating now. Five, six, seven parents with children with disabilities can come together, find an accessible uh, accessible playground, get two or three therapists, or even one. Even a parent can be there. This brings us all to the end of our third and final day of the Global Inclusive Education Virtual Summer Camp. 2021 all participants who have registered for this event will receive the following you'll receive a certificate of participation a free ebook written by Lola Anyeke called Special Needs Made Easy Volume 1. Usually you would find this book in bookstores for about 2,500 Naira, but everybody's getting it for free. You will also receive links to the full recording of the entire three days of the summer camp. And all participants can connect with us by joining our free weekly training pro program, um, which is on Once television. again, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Susan Illion, and it has been a particular honor to be your MC over the last three days. Take care and God bless to you all.